Good morning, everyone. Test check. Good morning. Uh, we are going to go ahead and and get started here. So if you uh, want to grab some coffee and find a seat, and I will open us in prayer. So let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study the subject of apologetics. And we pray that as we continue to do this, that you would bless our study, that you would help us to do it well. Help us to, help us to be a people who uh, know how to navigate these questions. Help us to be a people who know how to live. Um, you say to the disciples that I, I send you out as uh, sheep in the midst of wolves. So be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And we want to be like that. We know that we live in enemy territory. We know that we live amongst those who are skeptical. We live amongst those who are suspicious of you. Uh, and so we pray that you'd help us to appreciate that and, and make us into a people who are able to navigate these issues winsomely with our friends and family who we love, uh, who, who are not believers. And so we pray that you bless our study today and help us to understand this subject of the Bible and questions about the Bible. We also pray that you would bless what's happening below with our kids, that you would teach them and that you would deepen their faith and that it would be a faith that would last uh, for their whole lifetime. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again and welcome back to our study. Uh, we, this week and last week, are looking at the subject of the Bible from an apologetic perspective. And I'll start by saying that I love old Cincinnati buildings. Um, I live in an old Cincinnati building. Our house is about 120 years old, down uh, close to downtown. One of my good friends owns a salon that just relocated to the Findlay area. So they're located in a really old building down there that somebody um, just completely, they don't own the building, but who, their landlord totally renovated uh, all of these buildings for the people that are renting them out, just right across from Findlay. And when they were renovating it, they discovered that um, the building had a basement and it had a basement below the basement. Have you ever been in a double basement? So they, it had, a, had like two basements. And in the lowest part of the basement, it happened to be this, uh, it was, you know, full of debris and they, they had no idea what they had at first, but they discovered that it was one of those long lost brew tunnels from Cincinnati brewing history. Um, has anyone ever taken a tour of the old Cincinnati brew tunnels? If you have done so in recent years, you may even have been in this space that I'm talking about. I forget how long ago this was discovered, but it was recently. So the building was at one time owned by Link Brewing, which was a company in Cincinnati that was like hundreds of other companies was killed by prohibition. Did, do you know that only two, I think it was two breweries in Cincinnati survived prohibition and there, was, oh, there were hundreds before prohibition. Anyway, Link was one of those casualties. Um, Link Brewing, and they, they use these tunnels to lager their beer or to age their beer because they're naturally these cold places. But you would not know that any of that was down there just from walking into the door of the salon because you walk in, it's all updated, it's very you know, nice and modern, and, and, but they, there's this ancient brew tunnel, not, not that ancient, below. You wouldn't know that, but we have had an opportunity to go down and visit that space and it's kind of a surreal experience because you walk in the door of the salon, you're in the 21st century, you know, there's Wi-Fi. And then you go down into the basement, that's a finished space, there's still Wi-Fi. But then you go down into the sub-basement and suddenly you're, you trans go back in time a hundred years or so at least. Um, and you walk down in the brew tunnels, it's like you're in a completely different building. Anything that humans make that lasts over a hundred years begins to take on that kind of character. If it passes down over time and throughout the generations, gets passed down from generation to generation. And if it lasts, it kind of becomes a hodgepodge of different eras. And you know, I've, ne I've never really been outside the United States. So I've seen basic, the, the oldest stuff that I have seen is 
200 years old. And if you've never been outside the United States, then the same is true for you. The oldest buildings you've seen are 200 years old. But people who live in Europe, you know, they're, they're dealing with thousands of years of, I mean, imagine, you know, when, you're, when you live in an old house and you're working on your house, um, you cut into a wall and you see what all the owners did before you and all the mistakes that they made. Imagine dealing with thousands of years of that. that that's, you know, if you own an old house in Europe, I guess. Anyway. But uh, anything that humans make takes on this character over time, becomes a hodgepodge of different eras, different cultures, different design approaches. We live in an old house like that. If the Bible, shifting gears here, is merely a human work, if it's, if it's something man-made, just like all of these other things, then we should expect to see the same thing in the Bible as it has been created by humans and passed down from generation to generation and added upon and developed and all of that. Uh, we should expect that certain parts of the Bible would become outdated, just like parts of a building would, would need to be updated. We should expect that the Bible might feel something, might feel a little inconsistent, that it might feel a little a bit, a bit like a hodgepodge of different cultures and different eras. Um, that might, maybe would even contain contradictions. If the Bible were m- merely a human work, all of that would come as no surprise. But if the Bible is not merely a human work, but also the Word of God, as we claim that it is, one divine author behind all of the human authors, then it should be that none of it would ever become outdated, none of it would be in need of updating, and it should be perfectly consistent, even though it may have different flavors and cultures and, you know, still all of those different human authors, it still should be consistent and should not contradict itself. So last week we looked at this issue of the Bible and tried to make a case for why the Bible is the Word of God. Today we're going to be looking at criticisms of the Bible and seeing if we can generally defend against them because the Bible has come against uh, exactly these criticisms that parts of it are outdated. You know, the Bible's views, for example, on um, gender or on marriage or uh, parenting or, or any of these things, uh, that, that s- some of these things have become outdated, uh, or that the Bible is inconsistent, that it contradicts itself. Um, these are some of the criticisms that have come against the Bible. And we don't have time to look at all of the specific criticisms that are made, but we're going to look at kind of today two broad categories of criticisms and see if we can uh, provide a general approach to answering them. So that's what we're going to do. Here's our first one. Uh, And it is, this is kind of coming, oh, here it is, out of order here. Uh, The Bible is morally problematic. This is one criticism that has often been made, and I don't know if you remember that um, Dawkins quote that I read sort of at the beginning of the course where he's talking about the God of the Old Testament as the most terrible character in all of fiction, and, you know, he, he uh, said it most eloquently. So, um, anyway, so the Bible is more problematic, one common criticism that we see. How can the Bible be the Word of God when the Bible promotes fill in the blank, X, when all of us can agree that this is bad. So we're going to look at one specific example of this criticism to deal with it, and that is the issue of slavery. It, you know, you read in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, in some passages, we'll look at one passage very specifically, it seems that the Bible explicitly uh, condones slavery, and we can all agree that slavery is bad. In the ancient world, they didn't see it that way. So it would appear as if the Bible is a human document coming from a period of time and that it's morally problematic. It's become become outdated. Um, The Bible appears to promote, condone, or at least have no problem with slavery. So how can the Bible be the Word of God? Doesn't it make more sense that the Bible is a product of its own time? So how can we respond to that? Well, I think... You know, here's one example. So we're going to look at slavery today, but have you, what are some other examples that you've heard um, of the Bible being morally problematic? Maybe a friend or a family member. You promoted genocide. You said, wipe out everybody. Okay, yeah. Uh, some have even called it ethnic cleansing. That's a really bad word. Um, 
and, and some have said that, you know, the Bible talks about ethnic cleansing. God tells Israel to completely wipe out the Canaanites, and okay, that's good. What, what are some other things you've heard? Okay, yeah, there's many stories in the Bible of polygamy. Many of the heroes of the faith had multiple wives, so, you know, it, may, it does the Bible condone that, and that seems to be morally problematic. What else have you heard? Okay. Okay. David is a man of war. Uh, God is a man of war. Yep. Receiving a direct injunction to sacrifice one's son. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that seems a little morally problematic on the face of it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, parents, parents can understand that one, I think, a bit better. I'm, te- I'm teasing. I don't really think that. Um, great. Yeah. So, but and I wish we had time to unpack all of these things. We don't have time to do that. So we're just going to look at one specific example to kind of provide an example approach of how you might go about answering any kind, any one of these objections. But I think that what our strategy should be is we want to show that the Bible has been misunderstood, that the way that it's been characterized is is untrue, unfair. Um, Does the Bible really promote slavery as alleged? Good question to ask. Or does it promote polygamy? Does it promote these other things? So we're going to look at slavery here. But let's look at relevant sections of Scripture to see where this criticism comes from. And if you encountered someone who raised this criticism, even if you don't know how to answer uh, that particular question, because most of the time... And uh, we're not prepared to answer that sort of thing, and we might not have a great answer, but uh, this might be a good opportunity simply to invite them to read the Bible with you and say, well, hey, let's examine this together. Uh, let's look at the passages that you think are morally problematic, and then you can, you know, pray a bunch and, and, and pray while you're reading with them, oh, Lord, help me, you know, try to, try to explain this. But uh, study them together, see whether or not they really do promote these ideas, And here's how you might go about that with something like slavery. So we're going to look at Exodus 21, verses 1 through 11. It's probably one of the most difficult slavery texts in the Old Testament. So that's the one that we're going to look at. And this comes right after the Ten Commandments. Uh, It's in the context of various different laws being given. And the first 11 verses have to do with slavery. And it says this. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, uh, he shall, uh, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone." But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, you know, how often do we do that? Apparently they did that all the time. Uh, When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do, If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has broken faith with her. If he designates her for his son, he shall deal with her as a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, there's that polygamy thing, uh, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. So this is one of the most uh, difficult passages in Scripture dealing with slavery. How many of you would be excited to bring a friend or a neighbor to church with you if you knew this was the sermon text? (laughs) Um, This is more often one of those passages that we wish, that we simply wish was not in the Bible, because on the face of it, it sounds a little cringy. it, you know, just being honest. So does the passage condone slavery as we understand it? Is that what's going on there? 
And I, I would say that once we examine the passage a little bit more closely and carefully, we will see that it does not. So a few things to say about it at the outset. The first is that there are two kinds of laws in the Old Testament. There's what's called, and these are legal terms. If you went to law school, you might have heard these before, but there's apodictic law and casuistic law or case law. Does anyone know the difference between those? Apodictic law are, is, and this is true not just in scripture, but just in law in general, uh, general laws that are broadly true, such as ye shall not murder, ye shall not steal. They're just general apodictic statements of law. That's apodictic law. And from these laws, we can gather principles like, you know, ye shall not murder. God values human life. Ye shall not steal. People have property rights. We, we get that from these laws, etc. Casuistic law or case law is law that is related to specific cases, such as when such and such occurs, when this event occurs, here is how you should respond. So, for example, in the Bible, you'll see something like, when a man divorces his wife, these are the things that should happen. So it's, it's case law dealing with specific cases. And the Pharisees made this mistake because there's case laws about divorce where it says when a man divorces his wife, uh, then he must give her a certificate of divorce. And um, the Pharisees brought that to Jesus and said, look, you know, Moses command, tells us that here's how to divorce our wives, and so that must be something that's permitted, right? Um, and, but they're misunderstanding. No, this isn't, God is not commanding this. He's recognizing that this is something that happens, and then he's regulating it. So he says, when this messy situation happens, here is how that should proceed. So that's casuistic law. Or, for example, when two people are cutting a tree out in the wilderness, and one of them accidentally strikes the other and kills him. When that happens, here is, here is what should proceed. That's case law. Uh, just because the Bible contains case laws does not mean that it condones a certain circumstance. Does that make sense? So just because it's talking about a messy situation and what to do when that happens doesn't mean that it condones that situation. Just because the Bible tells us what to do when there is involuntary manslaughter does not mean that the Bible condones involuntary manslaughter, right? Um, it simply recognizes that such a thing happens, and then it gives us instructions for how to deal with it. So I think the first thing to ask when we see a passage like this is, what kind of law is this? And what we see here with the slavery laws, this is case law. It's, ca it's casuistic law. When these particular issues occur in the context of slavery, this is what should happen. When a man is sold into slavery, you know, when you buy a Hebrew slave, that's what it says. So it's not, God is not saying, ye shall buy slaves, or ye shall uh, have the institution of slavery. He's, he's not necessarily promoting it, uh, it's just recognizing that this is something that happens. This is a messy life situation. So the Bible is not necessarily saying that this situation is good, it, it's only regulating and managing this situation when it occurs. And that might sound a little bit confusing because there's still a lot of questions about that. Well, you know, why didn't God just, just say, hey, slavery is bad and don't do it at all? Why, why is he managing it? Um, but the, I think we first should recognize this. Any questions about that? Okay, great. The second thing that we should say for this issue in particular is that the slavery that we read about in Scripture is very, very different from the slavery that we are most familiar with in our country, which is the enslavement of Africans with the slave trade in our own country. And what we read about in Scripture is simple, simply not what occurred in America. It's very difficult to read this passage without assuming that these two things are the same thing because we just kind of interpret it through that lens. So when we read in verse 1, when you buy a Hebrew slave, I mean, what image pops into your mind in, when you read that, when you buy a Hebrew slave? I mean, we imagine, I, I don't, it's just hard not to imagine some sort of slave market, like with what we're familiar with. 
You know, it's like, oh, you go down to the Hebrew slave market and that's where you buy your slaves and that must have been what they were doing because that's what happened in America. But that's not at all what this is talking about. So it's not what the Bible is talking about here. The slavery we are reading about here is a, and you probably have heard this before, but it's, it's a debt slavery or it's an indentured servitude. So how did that work in their culture? If a person were to fall into debilitating poverty, or if a person were to accrue some unpayable debt to a neighbor or to another person, what could be done? Uh, they didn't have government safety, pro- safety net programs in ancient Israel. There was no welfare system. Uh, there was no Obamacare, that kind of thing. They, they, didn't, they didn't have that sort of thing uh, built in. But what a person could do was a, per- a person could voluntarily, this is their own decision, choose to sell themselves into slavery or to servitude, especially to the person to whom they owed a great debt. They could choose to do that as a way of getting out of their debt. And arguably, this is actually a better idea than the welfare system that we know uh, because it has a lot of advantages. It puts people to work, which is a good thing. Uh, It puts people into the context of a stable Hebrew family because you're going to work for a family. and Perhaps that's something that that they didn't have that they could benefit from for a season of time. And it could be very good for them to live in this environment as they worked and paid off their debt. So that's, the, that's the, um, the kind of slavery that the Bible is dealing with here. So the Bible recognizes that this happens. Such sl- slavery like this happens, servitude happens, where people fall into debt, they need to sell themselves into slavery. And in passages like this, it's actually, it's, it's not necessarily condoning the situation, but what it's doing is it's maintaining the rights of the slave. It's maintaining the rights that the vulnerable person has because they're in the vulnerable position they could easily be taken advantage of. You can imagine someone falling into, into debt and selling themselves as a servant in that culture, how easily they could be taken advantage of. But God says, no, they have rights that need to be respected. So let's examine the passage now with that in mind a little bit more closely and see what it says. The passage says that Uh, A slave serves a maximum of six years. No matter what the size of their debt is, they can only serve for six years, and in the seventh year they must be released for nothing. So that's one of the rights that they have. No matter how large the debt, it must be considered paid off after six years. Other passages of Scripture, especially in Deuteronomy, say that when the slave is released, his master should make sure that he doesn't go out empty-handed but that he goes out with a share of the profits that he brought to his master. So he actually makes some money and is able to go out with, with capital um, to, to get his life back on track. So, so it says that. Still, there are some difficult pieces in this passage. What about the business of the master giving his slave a wife? Some details that we notice there. Here it says that if a slave, if he comes in single, he leaves single. If he comes in married, He will leave with his wife. But if the master, if he comes in and he's single and the master provides him with a wife, and if they have kids, then at the end of his time of servitude, uh, when he is released, she she doesn't go with him and neither do the kids. But if the slave wants to, if he loves his master, if he loves his wife and kids, he can make a commitment and he can become a lifelong servant and remain with his master and his wife and children. On the face of that, that, that sounds a little harsh. It sounds like a tough situation. It might even sound a little cruel. Um, how would you begin to try to understand or explain that? Okay. Were they basically employees that uh, had to uh, stay for six years? Uh, were they treated well? Or was this a uh, bad situation? Okay. Yeah. And those are all good questions. Um, yes. I, I think it's especially difficult thinking about someone coming in, being given a wife, getting married, they have kids, and then when he leaves, there's this painful, awkward situation that the Bible is recognizing. And it is. It it, it is, on on the face of it, this is difficult to deal with. But in order to understand this, 
Let's first try to understand what is being said in the second part of this passage, which we also read. So in the second part, it says that uh, female slaves do not get released like male slaves do. Okay, already that sounds a little problematic. Um, then it goes through various different cases. Maybe the, maybe the female slave doesn't please the master. It says that. Um, and here's what should happen at that point. It kind of gives instructions for that. Maybe the master gives her as a wife to his son. And if that's the case, she, be, she should be treated as a daughter. Uh, maybe the master takes on another wife. And if that happens, she should still be provided for and... And then in, at the end of the passage, if the master doesn't do these things for her, she gets to leave for nothing for free. So what's going on there? Well, um, in Deuteronomy 15, in, that we just read from Exodus, uh, in talking about the year of release, which is the seventh year when all slaves are released, it says this. Here's Deuteronomy 15. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. So what's that saying? In Deuteronomy 15. I'll read it one more time. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. So what do we learn there? Men and women are to be set free. Yeah, but here it says that women are not to be set free. So what is this talking about? Here in Exodus 21, with female slaves or servants, this is dealing specifically with those who are sold to be married. And again, even that's a little difficult for us to understand. So if a man were to fall into debt, one of the ways he might resolve that debt with his neighbor is to give his daughter to be married, either to, either to his debtor or to his debtor's son. And this happened all the time in the ancient world and probably still even happens today in, in other parts of the world. Uh, but this happened a lot in the ancient world. And the Bible is simply recognizing that this happens. People do this. And the Bible says that when this happens, the woman has rights. She needs to be provided for. She needs to be taken care of. And here are the rights that she has. She's, she's not just a piece of property, but these are the rights that must be maintained. So here's the situation. Um, in that instance, she, so suppose she's, she's given to the master's son. She's to be accepted and treated and loved as a wife and as a daughter. So here's the, the situation is this. Suppose a man sells himself as a slave for six years. Suppose the master gives him uh, his daughter-in-law as a wife. And suppose they have kids. What happens when that guy's service is up and he leaves? Uh, who does the woman and the who, who do the woman and the children go with? This would have been an awkward and painful situation, and this passage here is simply regulating the different things that can happen in that situation. So, to conclude on this point, uh, if someone wants to say that this passage condones slavery in the way that we understand it, we we need to be able to show and to discuss with them that the Bible has been misunderstood. It's not condoning slavery because the slavery that's found in the Bible is very different from what we think of as slavery. And just because the Bible is giving regulations for messy situations does not mean that the Bible is saying that those situations are good. So the first thing that we might do with these objections like this is to um, study uh, the Bible with people to show them that it has been misunderstood. So any questions about what we've done there or that particular issue of slavery? Just Go ahead. Point. I've heard this argument made as well when you just hear about this in the New Testament too. Paul talking about how slaves are supposed to uh, interact with their masters. And again, Paul's going to be talking, talking about what that part of slavery at that point. The idea of chattel slavery versus indentured servitude, what this is. Chattel slavery. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Could, 
In this passage, yes, yeah. that's what it's talking about. Yep. Chattel slavery as we understood it in American history. Yeah. That absolutely is the Sure. Sure. Um, Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm not, and I'm not saying that it didn't. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm asking the question: Does the Bible condone that? Yeah. And so, and people will say that it does, and they'll bring up these passages. But I think when you examine these passages, we see either that it's talking about a very different kind of slavery, or there's some other issue that's being ignored. So. Yeah. So. So that would be my approach to dealing with an objection like that. Um, another uh, other serious category of objections is that the Bible contradicts itself. Not just, not just that it's morally problematic, but that it's internally inconsistent. Another criticism leveled at the Bible. A plain reading of the Bible reveals obvious and major contradictions. And God would not contradict himself. So the Bible cannot be the word of God. We, it's, you know, a document made by men, and so it, it does contradict itself. We would expect that. But it can't be God's word because God would not contradict himself. So how can we respond to that? Well, I think, you know, as we build a relationship with people and have opportunity to talk with them, our goal here is to show that, again, the Bible has been, has been misunderstood, that it does not contradict itself. If someone alleges that the Bible has contradictions, I would take this as an opportunity again to, hey, let's look at those things together. Let's, let's read the Bible together and discuss. And this is a way to build a relationship with that person and to examine the scriptures together. So uh, we, could, we could look at alleged contradictions one at a time and see if we can make sense of them with the goal being uh, to, to be able to read the Bible together and upon closer examination see that it does not contradict itself. So there's all kinds of contradictions that are alleged. We're going to look at three major categories of contradictions, and one is moral contradictions. There appear to be moral contradictions between the Old Testament and the New Testament, or perhaps even within the, Old, or within the New Testament itself, or within the Old Testament itself. Um, these are fairly easy to deal with, especially ones between the Old and the New Testament, but here's just an example. I think I have this text. So, uh, vengeance laws in the Old Testament. Here's an example of an alleged moral contradiction. Exodus 21, this is, comes from the same chapter talking about slavery. Wouldn't it just be easier if we could just get rid of Exodus 21? And then, um, no, it, we'd, we'd have the same problem with other passages. So Exodus 21, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So here is an example of a vengeance law that you can find in many places in the Old Testament. And it's summed up in what's the principle that you would use to sum this up? What would you say? Eye for an eye. Yeah, eye, eye for an eye justice. So that's the, we find this principle in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. But then you have Jesus in Matthew 5, and he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He's referring to this principle. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So here's another principle, and how would you sum this one up? Turn the other cheek. Very good. Two moral principles for situations when someone does you wrong. Eye for an eye and turn the other cheek. Uh, they appear to flatly contradict one another. There, appear, there, there appears to be this moral contradiction in Scripture. So how would you respond to this? Or just even what might you be, how might you begin to respond? 
Okay. Okay. So you would take the approach of looking at the Bible as this unfolding story, and there are some principles that are perhaps more immediately true at one point than at another point in the story? No. Okay, okay. Other thoughts? Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so there you would try to get it. Well, there's, there, there are differences between the New Testament and the Old Testament. And there are things that are introduced in the New Testament that change the game. You're, you're kind of going that route. I think that you, there can be some legitimate answers down that path. Some people have gone way too far down that path um, and, and have basically said, yeah, uh, Jesus actually completely did away with the Old Testament and and we don't need it anymore and I wouldn't want to go that far, but go ahead. Okay. Very good. Yeah. It's And if you read it in that way, it totally changes the tone of the text. And so we'll just look at that briefly. Um, So one thing to say here, some differences between these two passages. Moses is regulating vengeance or the tendency toward vengeance. He's saying that when these situations occur, so again, it's casuistic law, when such and such happens, when one person is seeking restitution or vengeance for harm, then the judges must make sure, and we, we read about judges in this passage, so this is in like a civil judicial context, the judges must make sure that the, that the restitution or the vengeance is balanced. So it says eye for an eye, and what that, that's not saying, you know, if someone pokes out your eye, you must poke out their eye. It's not saying that. What it's saying is only an eye for an eye. No further than that. Um, so if, you know, if, if you get harmed to this amount, you can only seek restitution to that amount. So it's, it's actually regulating how far you can go with uh, taking vengeance because we are prone to go overboard. Um, there was a, a famous politician that we all know who recently said that when, when someone punches him, he punches back ten times harder. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> But that's our tendency is when, when we're offended, when we're harmed, uh, we tend to want to respond in an increased amount and, and overpay that debt, so to speak. And Moses is regulating that vengeance, saying it should be balanced and fair, only an eye for an eye, only a tooth for a tooth. So he's also giving this in the context of civil justice. That we read about the presence of judges, um, and it's obviously directed at sort of a civil justice system. So what Moses is saying is that society should be careful to ensure that when there is harm and when there's someone seeking restitution, that the restitution should be balanced. The vengeance, there should be a balanced justice system, and judges should ensure that it is balanced. In the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus contradicting this when he says, turn the other cheek? I don't think he's contradicting that. I think that he begins by quoting the principle. He says, you're familiar with this. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But he doesn't go on to contradict that. Rather, he adds another principle. He says, when someone harms you, rather than seeking the full amount of restitution that you could seek, as it says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, he says, don't be so determined or quick to seek restitution in vengeance, but be quick to forgive. 
So he introduces this principle of forgiveness. Um, and he says, turn the other cheek. So uh, I think these principles, uh, these two principles don't contradict. They actually go well together. In civil society, when someone seeks justice, judges should make sure that it's balanced. But disciples of Jesus who have been forgiven should be quick to forgive others. So these, these two principles actually go together very well. So that's just an example of a moral, alleged moral contradiction. But there are also, any questions about that before we move on? Go ahead. Sure. Right. Yes. Yeah. And he does that with all all of those thing all of those laws he looks at in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, other kinds of contradictions that are alleged theological theological contradictions. Sometimes people will bring up what appear to be a theological contradiction in the Bible, like this. I think no, I don't have that. Sorry. I'll just read it to you. Um, Matthew nineteen twenty six, very famous passage. Jesus looked at them and said. With man, this is impossible. He's talking about who can enter the kingdom of heaven. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So there we learn about God, that God is all-powerful. Everything is possible with him. Nothing is too difficult for God. We agree that Jesus is saying this there. Nothing's too difficult for God. But then we read in a place like Judges 1.19, we're reading uh, the story of the continuing conquest of the land of Canaan. And it says this in Judges 119, the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. You ever come across that passage? So on the one hand, it says God can do all things, but on this other hand, uh, it seems that God cannot drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they have iron chariots. That's a, you know, those are pretty tough, tough to beat. So the alleged contradiction is, is that, you know, what, what do we do with this? I thought, I thought nothing was too hard for God. Why can't God drive out the inhabitants of the plain just because they had chariots of iron? This sounds like it's a human document, and they're not thinking through these things clearly, and they're not seeing the contradictions here. Um, how would you begin to respond to that? Well, here's how I'd begin to respond. Uh, when we look at the context of Judges chapter 1, and when we look at the entire book of Judges, where this passage is found, there's a lot of failures in Judges chapter 1. Chapter 1 talks about a lot of failures, not just the failure to drive out that particular people, um, but in verse 21 it says the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites, who lived in Jerusalem, verse 27, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean, 28, when Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not drive them out completely. Uh, verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the plain, and the Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Horez. So there's a lot of failure that's happening in that chapter. On and on it goes. In fact, throughout the whole book of Judges, there's a lot of failure. The book of Judges really is about failure. Um, that's the, a theme of the book of Judges, is the failure of the people and the failure of the leadership of Israel. And the big conclusion of the book of Judges is that Israel needs a strong king. It's time for Israel to have a king because of all of this weakness and failure. So that's what Judges is about. So when Judges says that Israel could not drive out a certain group of people, it's not saying that God was not strong enough to do this. It's not contradicting what Jesus says, that with God all things are possible. More likely it's saying that the people did not trust God or did not walk with God closely enough in order to see these things carried out. So that's just one example of a theological contradiction. And I think that they can be easily dealt with, this and others, by just a little bit of further study and pressing into these passages a little bit more that people will bring up. And here's a third example of contradictions. Um, a historical contradiction. This, this comes up when people allege that certain historical details are contradictory. And we'll just look at one example here. Um, Judas, the, the account of Judas' death in the Gospels and the surrounding circumstances. Maybe you've heard this one, but we'll just, we have Matthew's account and Luke's account. So here's Matthew's account. 
Uh, Matthew 27.5 tells us that Judas hanged himself, and that's how he died. Matthew 27.7 says that the priests used the money that they paid him, that he returned to them. Uh, They didn't want to put it back in the treasury, so they bought a field with it as a burial place for strangers. The priests did that. And Matthew 27, 6 through 8 tells us that the field came to be called Akeldama, or the field of blood. Why? Because it was purchased with blood money from Judas. That's what we learned from Matthew. Well, apparently Matthew and Luke didn't consult with one another when they were writing their accounts, because you turn over to Luke's account, which is in the book of Acts, and this is all in Acts chapter 1. Luke says in Acts 1.18 that Judas... That, um, fell, that he died because he fell headlong, and his, and his body burst open and his bowels gushed out, and that's how he died. Um, Luke tells us that it was Judas who bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, with the money from the priests, that he bought that field, and then in Acts one nineteen, says that all the inhabitants of Jerusalem learned about Judas's tragedy and his, his uh, falling headlong and all of his bowels gushing out. And that is why the field got its name, the field of blood, because it was Judas's blood. Um, and that's where it got its name. So the allegation here is this, this seems to be just a flat contradiction, which we would expect to find if the Bible were... Uh, written merely by a collection of men, but which we should not expect to find if the Bible is the Word of God. In both instances, we have Judas dying, we have money being used to buy a field, and we have the field being named the field of blood, but there appears to be different accounts of his death, different parties buying the field, and different reasons why it got its name. So here's a very famous example of a historical contradiction. How might you begin to respond to that if someone raised this objection? Okay. Okay. So you're saying these, these two accounts can be reconciled. Yeah. There it's it's not it's not a contradiction as as is alleged. They we can reconcile these two accounts. And you've given an example of how you might do that. Um, and and there's all kinds of little uh, accounts like this. Throughout the, especially in the Gospels, because you have four different Gospel writers who are describing the same event from four different perspectives, and there's all kinds of little discrepancies. Um, so, uh, okay, any other thoughts on that? This is starting to sound like a game of Clue. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the priest yeah. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah, I like where your head's at. Yeah, so another, another attempt to, to reconcile these two accounts, and I don't think it's all that far-fetched. Um, yeah, the approach that I would take with this is to, to see if these accounts can be reconciled. I think that they can. Um, it's, possible that Ju- it's possible that Judas could have both hanged himself and that he could have fallen and his bowels burst open. We can imagine a situation like that. Um, You know, if if I witness a pedestrian, for example, getting hit by a car and dying, I might say that person was killed because they got hit by a car, you know, because I'm just a a passerby on the street. But when the coroner arrives and he makes his assessment, what's he going to say? 
you're not going to read that in the coroner report, at least I don't think so, right, Curtis? No. It's going to be something like, you know, trauma, acute trauma to the head or whatever, you know. It's going, to be, it's going to be much more specific, a little bit different. He'd probably say that the victim was killed due to, you know, some specific trauma. So Luke was a physician. It's in Matthew's a tax collector. It's possible that Luke and Matthew are describing the same event but em emphasizing different details. So that's, that's on Judas's death. Um, who purchased the field? What about that? It's possible that it, it, it came from the money that Judas was paid to betray Jesus. Both accounts can agree with that. It's possible both that Judas purchased the field and that the priest purchased the field. Can't we reconcile that? Um, I just got the front of my house painted, and I only did the front, and then my dad thought it was a shame that I only did the front, so he offered to, to pay for me to get the rest of it painted, which I graciously accepted. So he's going to give me money to do this. Um, it would be accurate to say that my dad got my house painted because he's giving me money to do it. But I'm the one that's, that's dealing with the contractor. I'm executing the, uh, the agreement and all that kind of thing. So it's also accurate to say I got my house painted, even though the money came from my dad. So in the same way, it could be that Judas purchased the field. It was his money. But the priests were the ones who actually executed the purchase. So it's both, of, both of those things are accurate. And the same thing with how the field came to be named. There could be a double meaning going on there. So I think that... Um, all of the historical contradictions that are presented, and this is just an example of one of them, but there's, in the Gospels there are all, there's, there's many examples because, again, you have four authors describing the same event from four different perspectives, um, are, can be reconciled in a very similar way. And it can be a, an interesting study to, to reconcile them, and we can take a lot from that. But, uh, so kind of concluding what we've done here today, We've looked at some major criticisms that are leveled against the Bible, that the Bible is morally problematic. Tried to give you an example of how to deal with that. We've looked at three specific kinds of uh, contradictions that are alleged, moral contradictions, theological contradictions, and historical contradictions, and tried to show how we might answer each of those. So my conclusion is that we can... Uh, defend against these things very well. The Bible does not contradict itself. The Bible is not morally problematic as we examine it closer. And so we can make a good defense of these things. So I think that this will be our last week looking at the subject of the Bible. Next week we're going to turn to the resurrection of Jesus from an apologetic perspective. Uh, but before we leave the Bible, any questions or comments before we conclude today? Yeah. Disagree, appear to disagree. Um, uh, you should not murder, you should not kill. Sure. Many would say, the Ten Commandments would say you should not kill no matter what. When the text actually says you should not murder. And it's just a translation for the first. There's, yeah, there's lots of issues there, and I was actually... Uh, was thinking about talking about that today, but we didn't have I did, we didn't have time to fit it in. But there's a whole another category of objections um, that a guy like Bart Ehrman would bring to the table, and he's a New Testament scholar, and they would basically be wanting to say that the Bible that we have today, and this is a little bit different than what you're saying, but that the Bible that we have today is not what was originally written, and. He'll bring up examples of how many textual variants there are in New Testament manuscripts. So there's just thousands upon thousands of these differences between the texts that we're using to actually get to the Bible that we have. And how do we know which one's the right one? And isn't that a problem? We don't even know what the original documents were, so we don't even have them. So we don't even, if we say the Bible is the Word of God, but we don't even have it. Um, I think that those, that's a whole other category of objections. They ha there are people that have dealt with them very, very well. Um, but, yeah, but we, we didn't have time to get into that. But, yes, you'll hear that too. Anything else?
Yeah. And you know, most readers of the Bible and most Christians will read these two accounts and they'll see that they're a little bit different and they won't really care. And it's like, oh yeah, whatever, it's, I don't know, that's fine. Um, but skeptics will take this and this has become an opportunity for them to object to the Bible. They say, the Bible, look at this contradiction, the Bible can't be the word of God. When really it's like, oh come on, I mean, we can imagine how these things can be reconciled and it's not that big of a deal. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that um, do we really need to think hard about this kind of stuff? And can't we just, um, you know, go with the flow of the story and just accept the broader contours of the story? And I, I think that we can, but, but because these things are, are used as an occasion to object against the scriptures, it's, you know, it gives us an opportunity just to, just to provide an answer to that. So I wasn't contradicting what you're saying there, just sort of, yeah. Yeah, agreeing and responding. All right, that's all the time we have. Let me pray for us. Next week, we'll begin looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Our Father, we do thank you that you've given us your word, and we thank you that we know that it comes from a different time, from different cultures, that it can be hard to understand. But we thank you that as we examine it more closely, it doesn't become more disturbing, but actually becomes more amazing and more insightful. And, uh, and, and we see that it is true. Lord, your words are true. And so we give you thanks for that. And we do pray that you would help us to be good students of your word and also um, help us to be good apologists in whatever way that means for us. As you have surrounded us with, with skeptics and with unbelievers, help us to minister to them well. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.